Quick Clay greetings. Welcome to another video. Quick Clay. I'll come for hello. Um, today I'm gonna have to make this a rather a shorter video because I'm supposed to leave here in about two hours. <laughs> so but I have to get ready also. So hopefully less than two hours. So um, I want to share my screen. Okay. So um, it's a document and it's, uh, as we see, uh, let me take you, I want to read this first. Uh, the purpose of this DA pamphlet is not to make each of its readers an expert in the field of international law. This publication has been written with the expectation that the military attorneys making use of it will be provided with a basic understanding of the legal system governing the international community. International law is an area of jurisprudence with challenges. It quite often fails to provide concise textbook answers to problems which reach a degree of complexity far greater than that found in any other legal system. Entrusted with the task of regulating the conduct of international sovereign entities. Hmm. So you have to be sovereign? I just find that interesting because uh, it's a C jurisdiction. It is a legal framework which develops on a daily basis. Its successes go largely unnoticed, while its failures gain almost instantaneous notoriety and condemnation. It is a jurisprudential system, particularly in unsuited for complace, complacent personalities and regimented minds. Hmm. Uh, I just find that interesting because when you say it's international law, so you're dealing with states, which we're going to find that out. So you would think that a state would want uh, a, a, a sense of regiment, you know, like the whole, the whole point of, I would assume, of a uh, state laws is to get some kind of regiment going where, you know, you all kind of fall in line. So this is so they sound like they're saying here that you better be ready for all kinds of twists and turns because in international jurisprudential system, particularly, it's unsuited for complacent personalities. Hmm. But what about those personalities that are complacent on ruling the world? This is works fine for them, right? They have a complacent uh, agenda, right? So hopefully military attorneys will not view the often evident imprecision of imprecision, so it's not precise, is that what you mean? Of international law as a fatal, so they hopefully they will not view it as a fatal flaw, the imprecision, uh, as a fatal weakness but as an opportunity afforded its practitioner to develop an efficient and viable legal system. So it's like, it's almost like they're saying, it's we've, we're making it better as we go along and the more nations we get involved, we can start dominating that ass with more force because you're going to say, hey, oh, it's, it's all of these nations are joined together and it's only little old me. And as we read we seem to be reading that they seem to include military presence in this somehow you know so but we'll see you know where what this document is uh, basically uh when we finish reading this uh hopefully military attorneys military attorneys so this is about military it seems like it's just part of international law is military i think 
is what I read. Um, constructive criticism and the ability to apply concepts and rules to practical international legal problems must be based on a working knowledge of the subject matter. The achievement of this end underlies the purpose of this publication. Um, we don't want to get too deep. Okay, so the term he and its derivatives used in this pamphlet is generic and except where contradicted, constrained, decayed, what? Constrained, decayed, should be considered as applying to both male and female. Okay, so this document is meant for military attorneys to gain a basic knowledge of international law. So let's look at the top of this. Uh, I did find it on Anna's website. I know some, some people might have an allergy to Anna, but I'm telling you, uh, there's just a lot to learn from this woman. I don't care who y'all especially when it comes to i want to say law in general you know just in general okay so this is department of the army so that's what we saw da department of the army pamphlet uh so for military attorneys which honestly i don't think i've ever heard of military attorneys but i guess those movies like the one with uh, You Can't Handle the Truth, I guess that was sort of like a military sort of court. Tom Cruise and Demi Moore and Jack Nicholson in court. Maybe, you know, they had to have an understanding of uh, some kind of this, this kind of stuff, I guess. So this is from uh, Headquarters Department of the Army, September 1979. So we read what this document is supposed to do. And I just highlighted some things. It's a, uh, you know, this is over 51 pages. If you look up here, it says 51. I cut it off at 51. It's like 400 pages. And I wasn't about to try to deal with that. Okay. So my goal in looking at this, I hope you will see, because a lot of our, indigenous american indians i think they're seeking international uh law as their go-to you know like ah uh, if the national law that we made an agreement with and we have see if they're not working for us we can run to the international world and they'll solve our problems well what I hope you'll find is, hmm, ooh, how do I say this? Well, they won't solve your problems because it's a jurisdiction outside of anything that you've known. Uh, if you don't understand the jurisdiction that you're in, which was supposed to be basically based on our constitution, uh, how do you jump to an international? You're just looking for a savior, right? You just don't, you don't care. It's like, the, I heard something nice in Undrip and I'm coming, right? That's that's the idea, I think. So we, we let's make it simple, stupid. Like, you know, let's just make it simple. That's what's going on here. I heard something that sounds good. I think there's somebody out there in the international world that will come to my rescue as the nation that I'm in uh, beats me to a pulp, right? But similar, similarly to the Moors, uh, how do I say this? What we might consider is that we have entities like the Moors and the United Nations that are not really addressing key issues as to why a nation will fail. They're going straight to the people saying, here, here's your ticket out of here. They're not dealing with the oppressive government, if Indians hear what I'm trying to say. 
they're not really dealing with them. They're just giving the people, it's like another contract. That's what it really actually is. So what that ends up having the effect of doing, and please hear me out, what that has the effect of doing is saying that you, the man or the woman that's reaching for this international, this new international contract, basically you are stepping outside of a contract you were bound to in your nation. So what that has the effect of doing is telling your nation, I'm, I'm abandoning the contract as well. You abandon it as my government. So now I'm going to follow suit and I'm going to abandon it. Uh, abandon it. I'm sorry. So you have a contract laying there that the government has already bailed out of. And then you, the other party to the contract, you have bailed out because you look now your nation, is, they ain't saying a word, right? They sitting back watching you jump for jump on undrip, right? Or, or adrip, right? Because they want you to. They want you to ignore your original contract as well. You see? So it's perfect, right? And you're going to get like, you know, when we were sold, uh, I always say this, when we were sold the idea of becoming uh, citizens of the Democratic Party, whatever, that looked really good, right? There's a lot of promises made and, you know, you're going to be get equal treatment now as a citizen, right? See, we soon forget that it was all a rouge to, to get us in. And then once we got in, we found out, no, you're not getting equal treatment. They've changed the whole game. It's a whole new contract. It's a whole new contract. As, after you get in, you don't. We really don't understand legalese, right? So we don't know the trick little words, the little or word spells that really are taking us away from any protection uh, through the legal system, right? We're just uh, basically target practice that most people of color know we are, and then you got a big after you uh, fought <laughs> for quote unquote civil rights. And to be a citizen, now you have to beg just to stop cops from shooting at you. <laughs> so what did you get when you became a citizen, my, my brother, my sister? What did you get? You got more trouble. You got more trouble that you couldn't even begin to understand because you thought, like um, all of us did, that, oh, I, now I've arrived. I'm a citizen now. Hello, everyone. Here I am. And then you got a fusillade of bullets and injustice. And then you have the big punch. <laughs> that's the part that's really crazy. It's like, I thought I signed up for some rights that everybody else had, but somehow it seems like I don't got them. No, because you don't. You, you, We don't understand their system. They're, it's a, another language. And we're at a disadvantage, and they know it. And we just keep on following their lead. So now they created an international jurisdiction for us to fall into, right? And we'll, just like when we fell into the national system, because we weren't supposed to be part of that either, right? Now we're going even further off the land into an international sea jurisdiction. And we just know that this time it's going to work. This time they got my back. They don't even know you. You could say that the government here, at least they know you. I do believe they know of us, but what I'm saying is this is more far removed than what you're dealing with on your own landmass. You, you're entering an international uh, arena and they can pretend not to know a thing about you, which I believe is what they're doing. And that's why I was saying, um, similar to the Moors, the international jurisdiction, they're not addressing the fact that your original contract with your nation was troublesome. Your original, say, your constitution. There, what I would hope that a real earnest international type of deal would do was they would come in and say, look, let's revisit your original contract with your nation and let's see if they're going by what it said. 
Instead, they're offering us a whole new jurisdiction. They're not paying attention to what our, our, our contract said, right? They don't care about our constitution. They're not going to call up our constitution, really, when they're the new jurisdiction. They might refer to it, right? But I think if they were for real, for real, what they would probably do, now I'm not saying that we should have this kind of jurisdiction at all. I'm just saying that if, for me, what I know about how this crap works or not, they should be making sure that the two parties in a uh, contract are doing what they were supposed to do. And how are they, how is the government not following that contract? See, the United Nations should be more concerned about how did Congress gain uh, functions that were never outlined in their their, their enumerated, their 19 or so enumerated uh, functions. How did Congress go from 19 enumerated functions to over 300? What, how did that come about? Were the, was it, were the people clearly uh, notified that this had this uh, significant change in duties? which would bring about uh, a national debt that would go sky high and basically cause the people to be enslaved because of this debt on their back. That's something that I would hope if there were a, a, some kind of outside mediator, I would hope that they would uh, go by each contract made between people and their government. I wouldn't, I'd be suspicious, as I am, of an entity that is coming basically ignoring the atrocities or the uh, the breaches of the original contracts between a people and their government. They don't see, they're not addressing that. They're just here, they're offering you an undrip and saying, look, don't that look nice? Don't that look better than what you got? I, see, but you're not addressing why I would have to come to you in the first place. That's what the United Nations is not dealing with, really. So they're complicit in you having a broken system so that you can run into theirs. Okay, so let's just go to the highlights. This is a long ass document. And I just want to read some things. You could see the table of contents. It's a much a lot bigger document than what we have here and it's i you know call international law volume one the law of peace okay it's a pamphlet it's a, like a government pamphlet so i think i took parts from the chapter one and chapter two I think. and that was it just parts of those okay so let's just go down because um, and again i'm going i'm going to strict highlights Okay, so let's start with chapter one. Uh, chapter one, na nature, sources, and evidence of international law, the traditional and contemporary views. Section one, the traditional view of the nature of international law. Uh, one dash one, a multifaceted jurisprudence. It's a multifaceted jurisprudence. If asked to define international law, a professor would most prob probably articulate this classic definition. International law consists of those rules and regulations which bind nation states in their relations with each other. And I kind of want to stop there. Uh, well, maybe we should read. Although academically and theoretically correct, this definition nevertheless fails to provide the military attorney with any practical insight. So this is all geared toward a military attorney. Into the distinctive areas of international law jurisprudence, the interrelationship of these areas, and the sources and evidences of these rules and regulations. The purpose of this chapter will be to provide insight additionally the views of evolving and socialist states. You see, that was, I thought, I think that's kind of problematic because 
you have different types of states. You have socialist. I'm thinking at one time communist. And what was ours supposed to be? Uh, capitalist? I, what, I don't know. What, what, what were we supposed to be? Republic states or whatever? On international law will be examined in some detail. Far from being simply an amorphous collection of vague concepts and principles, international law is comprised of distinct components, parts, uh, component parts. As such, it is a body of law which has evolved out of the experiences and the necessity of situations that have involved members of the world community over the years. International law exists because it is to the benefit of all states. This is significant. So you have to have a state system uh, to have an international jurisdiction, you see? So they are somewhat dependent upon each other, but if Indians didn't have states to begin with, would international jurisdiction even apply to us? So international uh, jurisdiction is hinged on a state system that some sort of order govern their international dealings. So it's something for states because you're being made the same level of something that is inter like national, you know, like it involves other countries basically, but the other countries are submitting to states as well. You, they, there have to be states involved for there to be an international jurisdiction. And we already know that we're not supposed to be part of any states. So what use is international an, an international jurisdiction to Indians? None whatsoever, unless you're looking to further be part of your colonizer system. Let's just cut to the chase. I'm going to let you Indians know, namely Indians know, the international jurisdiction is not your jurisdiction. I think you know it, but again, because you are propelled by the same colonizer that ain't abiding by our original constitution with that colonizer, because you're being compelled to seek some kind of remedy to the atrocities and the breach of contract committed on your own uh, landmass, you are being pushed further away from your original contract. In your original contract, you are Indians not taxed. We don't know what we will be in the international sea jurisdiction. You had a status of Indian not tax. You were not part of the state. So how could you ever be part of an international conglomeration of states? Quick answer, you can't. Uh, I think, I hope what Indians will come to realize, as even as you hate what I'm saying, I hope you might walk away with after you've given yourself to the sea jurisdiction and your lords and masters, I hope you will at one point realize what the ancestors were offering us by waking us up, even as you turn it down. Because what you will find is that they were offering you the authority that you were supposed to have from the get-go. And that in that authority, you had free reign to create whatever you wanted, and it had better be recognized once we break down that everything outside of our landmass was colonizer uh, jurisdiction, and he's pulling us into it through his international vehicle, okay?
So what we were supposed to do to combat that was to have our own jurisdiction for Indians. And where would that prevail? It would prevail on all the American soil. Now, outside of that, they can have their international thing and with each other and their states, they can play colonizer games where they're basically dominating all the people on those land masses. Those, uh, those people that are representing them in the UN, I would, uh, we had better believe that those are their lords and masters in that system coming together to figure out what to do with the slaves, how to dominate them and make them think that they're not being dominated. The international jurisdiction is just an extension a wider extension of the state system and the federal system. The chart here, so let me see. So we stop there. Benefit all states, okay? There may be some disagreement among them as to what law applies to a given situation, but there is no disagreement as to the fact that some set of rules is necessary. <laughs> in the absence of a world government, ooh, <laughs> but they're working on that, aren't they? A world government, but you know now, you know, in the absence of a world government, these rules are made by the states themselves. Yeah, but the states have already been hijacked by the colonizers. We a perfect example of it is what happened in America. These states are not the original states. They are state of states, not the New York state or uh, New Jersey state. As I said, Anna would be the one of the uh, agents of uh, bringing us back to the states as they were meant to be in the original contract, which was not state of. State of is a franchise of the District of Columbia. State of New York, state of New Jersey, state of California, state of any state is a franchise of the District of Columbia, which is federal. Okay. Uh, so what am I saying? I'm saying the states around the world, you can best believe they're the same thing. They are not states run by the people for the people. They are states that have been hijacked by the equivalent of a federal uh, jurisdiction. As we know, the District of Columbia is not one of the states, right? But all the states have been made franchises of a district. So that means you're all falling under a British co uh, colonial rule or domination. Uh, I kind of have to pause here. Uh, let me see if I could. I'm sorry. Uh, I need to uh, have a call coming in. <laughs> let me see if I can pull up. Oh, y'all. I'm back. You're in for a treat. This is going to be a shorter video than expected since I have to get going very soon. Uh, yeah, it was a call with my, um, uh, movie buddies tonight. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we're going to meet and see a movie. Um, the, okay, where do we leave off? In the absence of a world government. Okay. So they're already setting us up. So they feel like there's a world. In other words, it's just necessary that we have a world government right uh so in the meantime in the absence of a what world government so the goal of international law in case we need to be reminded is a world government okay so in the absence of a world so far it's not there until we get every nation to be everybody running for an international sea jurisdiction right 
So after we've been tricked and we running for some remedy that we should have only sought on our landmass, we've given up on that, right? A whole contract and you just throwing it away as if people didn't die and we didn't fight in that uh, uh, war, right? Civil war, was it? Uh, that we that the, so all your ancestors that gave up their life trying to get <laughs> what they were never going to get to begin with because they got fooled. But the the point remains: all of that goes down a drain because we're going international now. Oh, you a big dog now? <laughs> I I wonder how ignorant Indians have to get before life swallows them whole i'm sorry if that's disrespectful the 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 crucialness the uh, cruciality of it all is also uh necessary okay we gotta understand we got fooled before let's not do it again we're still relying on some system that we did not create speaking of create the question on the table might be, well, if the Iroquois Confederacy are the ones who designed the Constitution, didn't we? Isn't that our creation? No, it's not. That's why it's always worded very carefully when they tell us that the Iroquois influenced the, the, uh, the Constitution. Well, as we've said many times, you have to take a document and change it. And then it's your document. So what happened is the Iroquois gave the colonizer a rough draft of what they should include if they're going to hoodwink all Indians uh, successfully. So the colonizer said, okay, we got you. So they began to make the constitution based roughly on the law of peace, right? But because they had their hands on it, it becomes their document now. The Iroquois, what the Iroquois should have done was just made the document point blank period and given it to the colonizer. That would have given Indians a leg up, but that's not what the Iroquois Confederacy was about that life. That's not what that life was about. The Iroquois left enough room so that all Indians could later be called black, colored, Negro, and all of that. You see? Well, again, what the Iroquois should have sought to do was to make sure that it was in their writing only. You come to my landmass, you go by my rules. But as the Iroquois are very much on par with the Washita and the uh, five civilized tribes, which I believe came later in time, yeah, the Iroquois actually were the first, I, I would think, if I'm mathing correctly, because yeah yeah well well yeah it would have been the iroquois that way you know next uh the algonquins had their we had our little dance with the colonizer he didn't like uh, that we were leading the dance so he got rid of that ass right found our enemy iroquois and they picked up the walls and dance right and they let the colonizer take lead right iroquois confederacy <laughs> you're all so big and bad but y'all was the uh, 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 the female in the dance. Uh, so that that's how that went. And they did that on purpose, y'all. It wasn't. It was not. It was a, 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 a purposeful uh, submission, so that it would be the uh, colonizer having dominion over all the other Indians and the Iroquois would just get like a, you know, a special uh, trader props with the colonizer. You just get favors from the colonizer, 
Lord knows what they are. But I think part of the deal was the the Iroquois are the ones who's promoting us as black. And then the corporation turns around and says that we chose to call ourselves black. No, it was the Iroquois that you were in bed with. Obviously, right? Why would we want to call ourselves black? when it's not in the constitution and why wouldn't the iroquois say wait a minute that designation is not in the constitution we gave you all some guidelines but we didn't want you to create new entities like blacks and whites it's free persons and indians right no so anyway we're gonna make this extremely shorter than i had planned because uh i end up having to buy the tickets i thought my um friend would buy the tickets for us but nope i that's what i just did i had to uh go through uh take a few uh extra time minutes <laughs> to purchase tickets so now i have even less time so um look at the chart there and let's look at how now what is interesting about this chart let's try to see if we can do this right Here's what's interesting about this chart that I need Indians who care to, to, to pay attention, please. Okay. Okay. Let's make it a little bigger. Okay. So let's say, uh, forget the little dot. Okay. Let's say that once the colonizer comes here, we're introduced to this level of a bigger system, right? We don't really know about this, but once we get this popping, the state system, little did we know that its uplink is this system. So we're the umbrella that we're, let's make it like an umbrella, literally, right? Sort of like that, you know? We're literally under a larger umbrella of law. Oops, I didn't want to. <laughs> okay, let, let's see. I didn't want to erase the whole damn thing. Come on. Okay, we're uh, so that, this, see this eraser. It this does too much. You know, <laughs> it does too much. I had a nice little umbrella, and now I'm getting all ranked apart. Okay, so uh, let's do that umbrella again. Hopefully. Maybe we could do like a, should we do like a, like a, no, let's keep it like it. Uh, I was going to do like a little like Japanese type umbrella, but uh, no need for that, right? Okay, so there's a little point there. And so maybe we'll put our, uh, yeah, we could do it here. Okay. It's a crooked umbrella, but it works, right? So we, Indians were introduced to this system, right? But look at the layout. So what am I trying to say? When colonizer came, he knew of this setup. We didn't, right? We just thought about the state. We just thought he wanted 13 little colonies. Meanwhile, he was looking for a world of states, right? So we're in this. This is built to fail, right? This is, uh, we're going to fuck that up real quick. Uh, and then the people are going to start like, help me international, see daddy, please, please see daddy, help, 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 help me. And that's exactly what we were supposed to do. Because now we got all this other stuff here and here. You got the UN now, you got the Hague of this, you got the Geneva that. Uh, you got now some, about some other self-defense, I don't know, world army, I don't know, intervention, getting all in your business and stuff, uh, and law of war. <laughs> <laughs> See, we had a law of peace over here in, this, in the state system, but once we got in the umbrella of international law, we had the law of war, boy. We had the law of war, boy. They got the law of war, boy. <laughs> See how they snuck that in on us, yo? See how they snuck that in on us? So uh, uh, another thing I wanted to look at, but my writing is all over it. You got to look at this. Look at it. So now I have to mess up my 
erase too much again. I didn't want to erase everything, but they're going to make me erase everything. Okay, that. I want to erase that, and I just want to erase that. Okay, good, good, good. So those that, when we talk about operating in the, in the private, okay, we think that that's outside of the umbrella, right? We think, oh, the answer is don't be public, be private. Well, when I tell you that it's all part of the same system, so what does that mean? It basically means a little, another dot we don't have to make that private, the idea of private is already built into this international system. It's the next level of international. They didn't tell us that this was the icing on the cake. They didn't tell us international law was the icing, right? We just, <laughs> we got nice little states of Alabama and state of New York, because that's what they were going to turn into, state of. We got the, 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 the. So we didn't know that all of this, if they're building a house like backwards, like, you know, they had the roof already. We just didn't know what was coming, right? So they do, well, actually, actually it was from the ground, but we just didn't know they already had a roof formulated. The ground would have been all of this stuff. And look how international is just woven into the state here, you know, the state system. You know, this is all part of state system. So it it's like state system, and, you know, I use this term a lot often lately, a, another Trojan horse, right? You get the state and then you get internet and then international comes popping out of it. And you didn't even know you were in it. Right. So they already knew that we would be in it. We didn't know. See, the system was already created. They had it all planned out by the time they came here. Had it all planned out. So what am I saying? Private, uh, you know, going private is still in an international jurisdiction. Public and private, because they created these words, right? They have specific meaning. So some people feel like, oh, the, the, the thing is go private. You're still in their jurisdiction. But what we have to do is get completely from under this umbrella. All of that stuff under the umbrella, we're not to be part of. And you wonder, but won't they just kill us after that? No, they won't, because see, we're going to use their undrip, not as it's ours, but we're going to remind them that wasn't the I what was the goal of your undrip? Then that's when we're going to find out the truth if they tell us the truth. That you know, then they'll tell us what the goal really was, hopefully. Uh, because they should have known that we shouldn't have needed an undrip if our government was working on a national level. They don't care about your government not working, they just need an excuse, any uh broken nation excuse for you to come running to an international jurisdiction. I hope Indians can get it. I mean, I, I'm not a genius, but I, 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 when I tell you I see this, because the more you read about it, it just becomes more and more clear. So let's see if we could uh, read more so you can get it more and more clear. So we're going to strictly go to the highlights now because I'm um, running out of time. Okay, the original development of international law. The Peace of Westphalia. I don't even know what the hell that is. International law. Come on, stop it. Stop it. We don't want you. To okay. International law is basically a product of Western what? European civilization. Another strike against India. You keep getting all involved in jurisdictions and things that just are not for you that's kind of sloppy right okay let's let's erase that let's erase that. let's go with the more redder highlight okay so international law is basically a product of western european civilization International law cannot be your savior because it comes from your colonizer. Does, is that hard to understand? Does the colonizer have anything for you except the theft of everything you have? When did colonizer bring you something good? I'll wait. Because when you 
uh, break it down, you find out it's no good, even if it looked good, right? Okay. Being a law between sovereign states, you see the states are part and parcel to an international jurisdiction, but we didn't know that when they started making states on our land, did we? We didn't know that it was already uh, what was coming was an international jurisprudence, right, or jurisdiction. So being a law between sovereign states, international jurisprudence did not need, no, I'm sorry, did not indeed, could not arise until the modern nation state system came into existence. Isn't that what we just said? So there was no international until the arrival of modern nation state system. They had this planned out, y'all. We're being led deeper and further away from, from our jurisdiction, our the one that Indians would have had. I don't even like to use their 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 names, their words, okay? Let's read that again. International law is basically a product of Western European civilization or the Moors. Who civilized Europe? Do, do we need more time uh, to bring about that answer? Who who who's a uh, big uh, announcement to the world is how they civilized Europeans. That would be the Moors, no? Okay. So international law is basically a product of Western European civilization that was given to uh, Europe by the Moors. Being a law between sovereign states, international jurisprudence did not indeed could not arise until the modern nation state system came into existence. The birth of this system is conveniently ascribed to the peace of Westphalia of 1648, by which the Thirty Years' War was concluded. It was, in a sense, the constitution for the states that almost to this day comprise the map of Europe. So the states started in Europe. So it was the constitution of the states that almost to this day comprise the map of Europe. International law did not develop gradually it arose rather suddenly as soon as they created the states. They knew that this is what they had for the states. To fill a definite need created by the fairly abrupt change in the composition of European political society, which resulted from the Thirty Years' War. So after the Thirty Years' War, they had states in Europe, apparently. Before that, I guess it was a straight up monarchy, right? I'm guessing I'm uh, Germany had a king, uh, France had a king, uh, Britain had a king, Spain had kings, you know, king, 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 right? And then they decided, well, we we don't want the people to know we dominate them. Let's create some states and dominate them through the states. With the people not knowing that the the fact that the, the, the ideas are coming from monarchs mean that they have the jurisdiction that the people will never have. They're creating all of this. Okay. Oh, uh, let's skip to gonna try to go strictly by the highlight. Major contributions toward establishing a viable system of international norms were made by. <laughs> Let's see if Indians are listed here. Um, the Hebrews, the Greeks, the Romans, and several individuals in the Middle Ages. Well, as you know, I don't believe we existed in the Middle Ages, did we? Did we exist in the Middle Ages since we were a new world? I'm not sure. But regardless, we are not mentioned uh, as any co uh, con contributor uh, to the inter the system of international norms, right? So we're not part of international jurisdiction, are we? Oh, that's uh, until they uh, sun us with undrip and shit like that and have us running like, Daddy, save me. <laughs> 
so so um the nation and the district of columbia was daddy so when you run out from daddy's uh jurisdiction you run right into granddaddy's jurisdiction but that's the daddy of your daddy which is a foreign daddy so he's not going to do anything much different from what Sonny Boy did, right? Right. So let's read it again. Major contributions toward establishing a viable system of international norms were made by the Hebrews, Greeks, Romans. That's nothing but the Moors, y'all. Y'all know that, right? That's why we have the Greek fraternities and all of that, and the brothers all up in there proud to, you know, being honored to the to the uh, ancient uh, Moors or the uh, proto Caucasians that were being reared up by the Moors. Make that you know that, and several individuals in the Middle Ages. Individuals. Are you talking about nobility by by per chance? Why would why would just some random individuals uh be part? What 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 are they? Just ooh, you just grabbed them off the sidewalk and they knew about international norms and stuff. Who are these individuals? The popes and stuff. Uh, what what who what individuals? The theories and schools of international law in the state system. Theories. Following the disintegration of the Holy Roman Empire, but prior to the Peace of Westphalia, the Renaissance widened man's intellectual horizon and the discovery of the new world. So, let's see. Somehow, the discovery of the new world stimulated the imagination of Greek philosophers, right? Because those were, that's where we, we learned that philosophers came from, as well as explorers like the Spanish ones, like Columbus, right? So the, the Greek philosophers, the Spanish explorers, uh, Vittorio, Vittoria, a Spanish theologian whose lectures were published in 1557 after his death, sought to apply the principles of international mor morality to the problems of the native races of the Western Hemisphere. So they did this all for you, Indians, so that they can take everything you own and genocide you. The gift of international law to the Indians. Did you read what it was about, y'all? They, they're applying their international morality to the problems of the native races. <laughs> they talk about you, uh, Indians. There's a problem. The problem was your land wasn't their land yet. That was the problem. Okay, so let's keep it moving. So far, do you like your international jurisdiction and UNDRIP, where UNDRIP arises from? Mm -hmm. Does it speak well to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do they say anything about your constitution for, for crying out loud? Hmm? Uh, sources of international law. In general, international law is based on the common consent of states in the international community. So they're trying to get the states to agree to, let's get this one world government popping, y'all. Come on now. Right? So it's the common consent of states in the international community. So everything has to be a state before it can be in the international jurisdiction. What does that mean for Indians? It means you're not included, but if you keep begging, I'm sure they'll create a state for you to be in, which means you won't be on your land, which means you won't be on your land, which means you won't be standing on your land, You'll be standing in a state. Who brought the states? Who brought Indians the states? Uh, can I get an answer? Uh, who brought the Indians the states? That would be colonizer, right? Okay. So 
once again, in general, international law is based on what? The consent of states in the international community. So the next step for a state is to join a larger group of states so that the one world order, the new world order can get popping. These sources are international agreements, treaties. Oh, treaties. Let's read the whole thing there. Determination as to whether such consent exists in a particular case or situation is a question of fact. Thus, the three primary sources of international law are those channels through which a state might give its express or implied consent. These sources are international agree. These sources are treaties. So the primary source of international law are treaties. Is okay. So what is that saying? That a treaty is coming from your colonizer, not from you. That is why I've come to the conclusion, unless someone has a different idea, please share. That is why the treaties fail. Why? Because they were not documents that originated from Indians. It was a document drafted by your colonizer and named by your colonizer. So you could comply with his new rules that he's going to impose on you. So first it was forced on you, just like Christianity. And then it became this thing that, oh, this is what you wanted. This is what you agreed to. This is what you wanted Jesus as your savior. We didn't, we didn't force that on you. That's you just do. That's how you do it. When you want to be saved, you get you grab a Jesus. So then it becomes now we forget that the treaties were imposed on us basically by force, duress. And then we wonder why the treaties can be just ignored. It's all coming from your colonizer. If it if it originated with your colonizer, it's his to control, not yours, Indians. Do you wonder why Heru keeps saying that you have to create your own so that you can have the dominion necessary and get them to agree to that? And they would have to because otherwise they'd be in uh 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 what do you call it? Let's just say in danger <laughs> of committing genocide. in jeopardy of creating uh, or committing genocide, I should say. Uh, I hope we are seeing how interwoven the state is to an international jurisdiction. As soon as we had any states in America, they were automatically bringing you remember he said it was it was instantaneous as soon as a state was created an international jurisdiction was created because they're making states everywhere not just in america so then they're going to call their little puppies all together right mommy done named you and then mommy going to call you and anyone who's in you're going to be dominated by your international daddy this is why Indians don't want state, federal, or international anywhere in our vicinity. Can you imagine that they're trying to literally take over the world and they almost succeeded? All they need is Indians to once and for all give up that birthright completely. And we have the five civilized tribes and the Iroquois Confederacy and any federally recognized tribe doing just that. You're giving Congress plenary authority. And then when Congress decides that it's time for you to be in an international jurisdiction completely, because they have plenary authority over you, that's where you go. But if you say to this system, you have no authority over me, I don't have to go by your international system whatsoever, but you better not come looking to uh, 
genocide me because we're going to call out the genocide. Now, if you're so against genocide, you need to be for Indians having control of their land. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be synonymous with your undrip, uh, uh, alleged uh, rights of indigenous people? Wouldn't you have to agree that Indians should control their their shit, their ancestral land, and not you? Uh, you know, it's just Indians have to decide if they're going to lay down completely and get rammed indefinitely, or if they're going to get up and say, I I've had enough of this. It's my turn. Uh, these sources, yeah, so now we hear where the treaties are. They almost, it's again, it's a system that comes with all of these. It comes with treaties. It comes with uh, international jurisdiction. The states bring treaties and international jurisdiction. International agreements, without question, international agreements now stand as a primary source of international law, so treaties. So a treaty is part of the colonization process. It's not originating from Indians. It came built in with the states and the international jurisdiction, is what I'm saying. Before this uh, entity, Indians did not make treaties with each other. So, the subject of treaties is extensively dealt with in Chapter 8. Thus, for the present discussion, it is sufficient to simply describe the role of such agreements, the role such agreements play as a source of international jurisprudence. The treaty is a source of international. Did you hear that? The treaty is the source of an international. As soon as you made a treaty with this beast, you created an international juris jurisprudence or international, you know, monster. It is, uh, let's read that again. Thus, for the present discussion, it is sufficient to simply describe the role of treaties as a source, it is a source of international jurisprudence. A treaty may, one, declare, expand, or modify an existing rule of customary international law. <laughs> so a treaty is all about international law, right? It might declare, expand, or modify a, an existing rule of customary international law Two, abrogate such a rule as between parties. Or three, provide a rule of law where none previously existed. That sounds like what happens to Indians, right? When they have a treaty, all of a sudden laws that you never uh, made are existing. That's what a treaty can do. And that's what they did. Told us where we can go on our land. Just by agreeing to that, it's like the, I think the, it's his document, okay? It's his document. Let's skip down. An often stated rule is that only states party to the agreement are bound to its by its terms. Treaties cannot control the actions of non-parties. But think about it. If everything is a state, you know what I'm saying? And they get enough states to agree, do they need all of the states? Because I believe that's what we're going to read in the, hopefully... Uh, in the next uh, highlight, uh, many modern jurists and publicists contend that international agreements may also establish rules for non-party. See, that's exactly what we're talking about. So in other words, even if you're not party, hopefully the treaties will establish rules for non-party in two ways. First, many treaties contain provisions that purport to merely codify existing rules of customary international law. I'm not hearing about national law, by the way. I'm, I'm not hearing about, you know, 
it's at least written explicitly here. The, these rules are followed by the contracting parties, not only because the rules are part of the treaty, but also because they would be considered as binding international law, even in the absence of any treaty. Naturally, the greater the number of states, yes, this is what I was hoping we'd read, the greater the number of states party to the treaty, the more often the agreement will be recognized as binding and more the likely it will be universally accepted as declaratory of a rule of customary international law. So the more states involved, the more they hope to dominate everyone, even those not party, with this rule of customary international law. Secondly, non-party states may have a strong incentive to follow the treaty practice of the states party to the agreement. So in other words, it's something where they're hoping to influence those toward if we're sovereign why would this thing want to make us hope that we uh follow the, the treaty practice of the states party to the agreement why would if if you recognize that we are sovereign quote unquote sovereign states why would you want us to be more and more uh under like one uh system that everyone else is by if if you're sovereign you want to do you want to be able to do what you want to do you know so why are you hoping that we all cave to you know the the see it's kind of like double talk here because you gotta hear it when they say they hoping but okay they would be a, considered as binding in international law even in the absence of any treaty. So in other words, even if you're not part of the treaty, it's going to be considered binding international law if enough people are going by that. So then you're going to be... See, that is not how a republic would work. You see? What you just read here is low-key democracy. That's democracy speaking. In other words, you better fall in line because the majority of people did. You don't get, like in a republic, what a republic is supposed to be. You still get your your uh choosing to not go by what everybody else is doing is is a given. It's your right, right? Right. But they're hoping for a more a democratic system where once you see all these other states doing it, baby, you shouldn't feel the pressure to do it too. Or even if you don't uh, aren't part of the treaty, it will be considered as binding international law without you being a part of it. You're just going to have to go by those rules anyway. So I think I had one more, thankfully, and that'll be it. I just want to go where I really could make it clear for you okay here we go this is the last one uh so as are most of the fundamental principles of existing international law these are concepts that are basically western european and now they got so okay so we we needed to look at these are contemporary views of international law. what we read before was more uh like before they became contemporary you know like it's a prior uh, views of international law. Let's see, section two. Let's see what section two says. Because, in other words, these are more modern, but the origin, let's see, section two. What was section two again? Because I think that's going to help us. Chapter one, section one. We want to go to section two. Or did I, did I somehow skip section two? Sources. Okay, so that's what we want. So what we read up to that point of getting to the last section three these are the sources and evidences so the source what i'm trying to show you was all european 
Now, the contemporary, that's not the source. That's current, right? So the implication here with the uh, section three is that these are contemporary views of international. Now we can include, uh, as we did right here, Western European and North American in origin and nature. So contemporary uh, views are North American in nature and Western European. So little by little, you know, gradually, America is sort of linked, being linked with Europe, right? That's the most biggest uh, wet dream is to, well, it's going to look like we're in a partnership, but the truth is, as we should know by now, we're just being dominated with a European uh, everything. Their ideas of law, their ideas of uh, uh, everything, justice. You know, it, we're we're not we're just sitting back being dominated, but then they're going to say this is Western Europe and North America. No, it's not. No, it's not. You you at this very moment you're uh, dreaming of ways to genocide uh, American Indians because you haven't given up anything in in your current laws, have you? No. And the way Indians are acting, like they just want to join. That ain't going to get rid of the, the, the oppressive system, yo. We have proof of that with the Washita, if you need some uh, proof. We are the Washita. As, as popular as they think they are, what difference did they make in uh, the rest of Indians that are not part of that uh, little uh, federally recognized system? Are they doing anything to uh, save our necks? No. So when you become part of the federal system... You don't, you bet not start thinking that you could uh, resurrect Indians and, and, and be of a, uh, Washita have been around for a while now. I don't see anything that they're doing to end, like, it's, you're part of the United Nations. Uh, first of all, you should have been, if you were for Indians, really for Indians and not just for yourself and you're mixing you would be looking out for all indians point blank period and i i don't mean that we have to sing kumbaya that's not what i mean i mean some indians would like to see indians controlling america and there's some indians that say well no we want colonizers so that we can control other indians together with colonizers that's what they that's what the, the goal of federally recognized is. Once you come federal, you part of the government now, baby. So these random Indians, they we gotta get rid of them because they are uncivilized. That's the idea, y'all. Civilized basically it was supposed to mean you are Christianized. So, in other words, if you don't accept Christianity. Which, but it doesn't matter. We've accepted Christianity and will anything change? No, no, right? But they still want you to be Christian so you can basically not question your, uh, your uh, genocide. This just cuts and chase. Because you're supposed to lay down and lay your life down like you're a savior did, basically. But that's for American Indians. I don't know about anybody else. I just know that that's for American Indians because that's what was forced on us when colonization appeared through Christopher Columbus. This is what was forced on, on Indians. It was the Christian uh, doctrine, right? With the advent of many newly evolved and socialist states on the world scene, this traditional view of international jurisprudence has been changed. So they don't care if you're socialist, again, communist, whatever, you know, just be a state so we can dominate you. They're not, in other words, they're not trying to solve the ills of each nation. If you're a socialist state against your will, oh, too bad. We still accept socialist states in our world state system. Okay? And I think I want to revisit, this was the end of my highlights. 
I think I want to revisit that if I can find it, hopefully, because I did bring up a lot of other stuff. I want to find that document uh, where did I close it? Because I'm not going to get to all this, obviously, right? Uh, I want to get to that document. I hope I didn't. Uh, where it was from, um, it was from Glenn Fern. Okay, we're going back, 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 back to, uh, should be Glenn Fern when he brought up the congressional record and the concern of the. On the in the House of Representatives by honorary, what was his name? I'd have to find. I don't know if I have that still up. Uh, but his concern was this state system that was taken over, right? But if I can't find it, uh, might have to maybe link it or something. Uh, Okay, so that was uh, Anna's thing. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I wanted to go through all of that, but I'm not going to be able to. I'm going to be ending this pretty soon, within probably five minutes. Um, do I have it with my um? Ah, do I have it here? Uh, I don't think I have. Um, yeah, we go back to those other videos. Um, I don't have it up, so. Hmm. Um, where could I get it? Would I be able to get it? Yeah, maybe. Uh, but she basically what I was looking for, which I'm not finding. I think I closed that window, but it was basically I should I should have left it open. Uh, no, that's not it. Not it. Beto's making. Uh. Uh, okay it was the congressional record where we read um, we read the concerns that uh, I will have to link it I will have to try, try to link it in the description box but if you recall in the last video I would really wish I had it up here uh, it was um the congressional record where the uh, representative in the House of Representatives was talking about his concern that this British, it was like, he said it was like being colonized all over again by under British, uh, you know, domination. And he said it was a, a international system of states. And he mentioned specifically states. This is what he was talking about. This is exactly what he was talking about. And this is in a congressional record. So this is not some crazy conspiracy theorist. This was a man who was able to see where this uh, alleged ship was headed. So um, on that note, we are exactly um, at the one and a half hour mark. I think I'm going to leave it here. I wish I had that document up. I will definitely have to look to link it. But here's what we were reading, just so you have it. Uh, it was part of the law piece. But I want you to maybe just remember that's what it was about. You know, if you want to freeze that before you uh, say goodbye for now.
uh, that's what we will, you know, to make note. It was to teach us about the international uh, jurisdiction. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop my share and say thank you for watching. I'm glad, you know, we're cutting it short because, you know, we there's a lot to cover, but we shouldn't try to do too much in one night. People can't watch this many hours and stuff. Uh, Till next time, I thank you so much for watching. I uh, wish you peace, health, wealth, your land back, your identity back. And may you be and stay highly favored. Thank you again.